So, as you may know, this is John Bilkey's last lecture, and we are very sad to see him go. But this is like, he's going out with a bang. Um, as always, there's snacks and tea in the back, help yourself. And next week, on Tuesday at 5 p.m. in the same room, we're going to have video day. So it's like what a substitute teacher would put on on with the last day of class. So we're going to put on a lot of historical videos that are kind of fun. And yeah, take it away, John. Yeah, so our, our video day is going to be, you know, fun because that's week 10, that's going to be a tough time, so that'll be just come in here, watch some funny videos, and uh, yes, great info chance. Are we physically wheeling in one of those carts that has the food TV and the VCR on it? Does the library have? No, not <laughs> I'm sure we did at one point, but not any longer. <laughs> the um, TV on the top of MLH and the 12 floors from the library, that was the old video chart. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I guess I'll get started here. Um, if any of you guys have watched last lectures before from like professors or things, uh, MSOE used to do them. We kind of stopped. Um, a lot of time and those are spent on the lives of the people. Um, I'm not going to focus as much on my, my life, you know, I don't feel like having a meeting where I pull people in to just talk about me. Uh, I'll do a little bit of it because it's like traditional. But then I'll just go into kind of stories from MSOE and what I've learned, uh, you know, just doing things here and kind of being as involved as, as I have been. So hopefully you'll get a little more out of this than just, you know, who I was. <laughs> um, so with that, I will get started here. So this is me in 2001. I was born, um, you know, Good old mom and dad, um, you know, my mom came here from the Philippines um, from what I would call a rather privileged lifestyle. Of course, you have to consider um, with the Philippines that hiring help is like a dollar a day or something. It's, it's not expensive, so a lot of people do. But she came from a, a background where, you know, her family had um, cooks, maids, drivers, um, and that lifestyle was just not something that she was interested in you know, having for the rest of her life. So she chose to move to the United States and she actually worked at a gas station as one of her first jobs here. Um, that station got robbed when she was not working there, but that was kind of the area that she was living in um, and the lifestyle that she chose to enter um, when she left her home. Um, her family came from China also and they had gone through struggles with running a business and losing everything a few times. So that's kind of the background that my mom brought in. And of course, you know, my dad, my dad's side of the family, they're the ones that I know more because they're from the United States. Um, so I'm very close with my grandparents, who were both teachers. You know, my grandma was a history teacher for some 35 years. Um, and my grandpa was a uh, psychology teacher for a while in high school, Highland Park High School in Illinois. Um, so they, they were both very influential to me, you know, growing up. Um, I, I really had an appreciation for education. Um, and, and even like a lot of my teachers would actually know my grandma because they, they were like her coworker. Um, so to them it was kind of horrifying to have me as a student because I was the grandchild of their coworker and it made them feel very old. But also it was very fun. Um, you know, and they would tell me stories about my grandma from that side that I never heard. Um, and that, that was always very fun. Um, but I did really appreciate having my family so close to me growing up. Um, you know, my mom and dad um, raised me well. You know, my dad um, was very involved with technology. Um, so he is kind of like a legend with sales. You know, that's his, his bread and butter is sales, so he travels around the country. Um, and you may notice around MSOE now, we have a lot of those like touchscreen panels, the BenQ panels, the BenQ projectors in classrooms. So my dad and I demonstrated those to MSOE, and ultimately the university bought them. So yeah, that's how deep I go into this whole thing. Um, but you know, he, was, he started out, I believe, at Sprint. 
and then he, like, you know, the telephone company at Sprint, and then he went over to um, Zenith Data Systems to sell computers, mostly to schools. After that, he worked at Acer and did more education sales of, like, laptops to schools. Um, went from that to Epson. For most of my childhood, my dad was Bill from Epson, you know. Um, so sometimes if you call him on the work phone, he'd say, you know, Epson, this is Bill, and that kind of stuff. He'd always wear his yellow Epson polo around. So that was the iconic look of my dad growing up. Um, and, you know, since he did sales, I was actually able to tag along with him around the country and see various parts um, that I probably never would have seen because they aren't like tourist destinations. They were schools that we would go to to sell products. Um, so like Syracuse, Indiana, or, you know, we go to just random small schools in Wisconsin and that type of stuff. Um, but it was just, you know, fun to tag along with him on these trips um, and, and to see that. And um, that's how I learned a lot of uh, the skills that I have as far as, like, networking and just, you know, how I interact with people is through the lens of my dad, who was a salesman, you know. And even just walking around the career fair at MSOE, I have people um, who would like stop me as I'm walking around and they would say, you know, I think that someone in your family does sales because of just the way that I walked around and the way that, you know, I shake people's hands and I would talk to them, look them in the eye and the way that I spoke around the career fair, they identified that I had that, you know, in my background, which is very interesting. Um, but that's something that sets you apart really from engineers is having that mindset and that interest in people rather than just, you know, uh, technical sides of things. And that's also kind of going into this club is, you know, it's stories from people from the past. And it's not only about, you know, Newman was a robot at MSOE, but Newman was built by MSOE students to advertise to people. And, you know, why did Newman get disassembled? You know, what happened with that? And that, that's kind of what interests me with history is more of the interpersonal things than just the backs, you know. So off, to, off on that tangent, I guess I, I have pictures too, so I should have changed the slide. And then my younger sister, of course, I have to mention her. She's a sophomore in college. Uh, she was the athlete of the family, you know, where I'm kind of the, the nerd. <laughs> so my sister uh, plays uh, varsity tennis at her college. Um, so that's my grandma, my grandpa, my mom, and my dad. Um, so, yeah, big thing about that. And, you know, my grandparents have a, a small lake house up north that I would go to a lot. And so the reason, one of the reasons I picked MSOE, and there were many reasons I picked MSOE, one of them was specifically because it was in Wisconsin. And I really liked being in Wisconsin because of that lake house. And I associated it with that. <laughs> also, I'm a big Culver's guy, so it all kind of funneled together. But the big thing on choosing MSOE was when I toured the place, um, I was in a bus with Nick Seidler, who at the time had a uh, green a mohawk because of St. Patrick's Day. Um, so that was my first experience with MSOE. Um, and Nick Seidler, of course, is the advisor of this club now. Um, but he showed me that there was a specific, um, like a general vibe around the university where it was very nerdy and the people were all interested in these niche things and the university really supported that. And that's something that I thought was really cool that I didn't see at a lot of other schools um, was, you know, the level of clubs interested in, you know, random things like, like, you know, I mean, I'm sure Concrete Canoe is pretty common, but that's just such an interesting thing to me that that is a club that has a very large following here. Um, but there are a lot of very niche clubs at MSOE, uh, such as this one, I suppose, um, that really, you know, piqued my interest. And, uh, you know, before I applied to MSOE, I didn't really know anything about them. I never heard of MSOE. Um, really, I found it because it was free to apply and there was no essay. And I, I've heard of that from a lot of people, that that's kind of the big draw for them. Um, is that it's just really easy to apply and then you get that aid offer and you're like, okay, well this is pretty good, you know? So, uh, going into it, I guess I didn't even know where the path would take me up to that point. Um, I guess from these pictures I'll point out, that's the opening of Derek's Hall. And uh, I am right there. My roommate next to me was Phil. We went to high school together. Got along very well. 
I didn't really know him from high school though. And when he arrived here and in that picture, it's very quick for me to find myself in that big crowd because my roommate was bald. Um, because he had, um, I believe, testicular cancer. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of why I'm really interested in St. Baldrick's here and raising money for childhood cancer research is that I had that experience with Bill. Um, and Bill and I spent a lot of late nights doing labs and stuff together. And um, this is my floor freshman year getting um, dinner. And I don't know if Phil is in this picture, but we would do a lot of floor dinners together, you know, on floor 10 of MLH. So that was always a good time. Um, getting involved, uh, Angel here, Angel and I go way back. Oh, we um, So starting the freshman year, actually, um, what I would do is, I, I never really was too into like the clubs on campus for a while. I was more interested in the friendships that I made with people. So like, I don't know exactly how I met Angel. It was probably because of the MSOE Discord server that I joined in the fall of 2019. And right um, up in the Uno, like the very but first But that, that's Uno what I'm getting to. Oh, I think you were invited through the Discord though. Yeah. But I was very interested in meeting people in these one-on-one -on -one interactions. And what I would do is I would run these game nights in my room. So we would do Uno or we would do like BS, you know, or um, I don't know if we did any other card games, but it was mostly card games. And one night we did a southern cooking night where I used the illegal toaster oven in my room <laughs> to cook some southern cuisine. And we had a guy from Georgia that stopped by and actually said that it was pretty good. So that was a good pat on the back for me. <laughs> but um, that's kind of how this all started is I wasn't even in clubs. I was just running my own things in my little dorm and I'd have people over on Friday nights and we would uh, you know, have snacks and play card games. And then um, from that, I started to go into more legit avenues. I think mostly because of COVID. Uh, I would, well, it depends, because a lot of like joining clubs is you join a club not really because of the interest in it, but because of the people that are in it. Maybe some of you can relate to, you know, being here now for that. But, um, so I joined RHA in the winter of 2019 because of John Shields the third, the legendary John Shields the third, who needed brainstorming help with the St. Patrick's Day float, St. Patrick's Day parade float that they were building that year. So I was, you know, I started attending meetings for that, and a lot of the ideas I came up with were like complete jokes. Like I said, we should make our float like World War One trench themed and stuff, and it, it was awful. And we'd have like a smoke machine and stuff. And it, in context, it made sense, but out of context, it's completely ridiculous. But at some point, we reached that, um, you know, that idea. I don't know how we got there, but I remember that, and that was pretty funny. Because, um, well, I think the previous year we'd done like Roaring Twenties or something. So, you know, naturally, you would pick another uh, historical era. But, um, <laughs> um, so like joining RHA, I think might have been the first club or super mileage, one of the two. And super mileage, I'll, I'll get to that later. I'll get to that later. Um, but so RHA, I believe is the first club that I actually got into. And um, because I was doing the game nights in my room and inviting people over, my RA told me that I would probably make a pretty good RA. And uh, he wanted me to apply, of course. Uh, I did not that year. I actually was looking at apartments and stuff um, because I wanted to stay with my roommate, Phil. You know, we got along very well, and I figured that would be more important than becoming an RA, even though it would have been a lot of fun. You know, it's what I thought at the time. Um, so that's kind of how that went. Um, fl flash forward a bit. <clears throat> you know, end of spring, COVID hits. Um, things got pretty bad. Phil is not enjoying his time at MSOE, so he becomes a business major at Lake Forest College in Illinois. So with that, I have an apartment, you know, the lease is kind of signed, um, and I have to figure out what's going on. You know, I can't be an RA anymore, so sad. Um, and I end up being put in the Aloft Hotel under MSOE residence life because we're out of space in the dorms. Yeah, so that's how that all goes. Um, and that, that was pretty crazy. Um, and then after that, you know, after that year, I live another year in the residence halls. I hang out with Mitch a lot and John Shields, who are both kind of my um, 
my neighbors on the floor. You know, we got up to a few shenanigans. Um, and in this year, I'm pretty involved with sub. You know, student union board, which I have the shirt on today. Um, that was kind of the big club that I focused a lot of my energy on. Um, oh, I should also mention, I forgot about Radio Club. I joined Radio Club in the fall of 2019. I missed the first meeting, so there's a, a picture of everyone in the Radio Club um, where they took the picture at the first meeting. So it, it may be understandable to, to think that I wasn't in the club, but in fact, I only missed the first meeting that year. So uh, I was in the Radio Club from freshman year to now. I only got my license in May <laughs> of last year, so um, that's kind of funny too, um, but I was in the club for a long time, um, but with Sub, Sub is where I really became, you know, the John Bilkey persona that became kind of legendary on campus. Um, Angel and I were co-hosts for um, Sub's Halloween bingo, spooky bingo, you know, so before that, Bingo had been a long-running thing at MSOE. I didn't invent bingo, you know, and actually RHA ran bingo for a while, and then Sub started doing it when COVID hit, because bingo was really the only event that we could realistically do with a large number of people on campus. Um, I mean, you couldn't, it was not allowed to have a gathering larger than like 20 people on campus at this point. Um, so what we had to do was, you'll notice my laptop was in front of me, and I would, you know, have a video call going, and I'd be calling out these numbers and things. Um, and then people, you know, on the call would, you know, come down to the CEC and pick up their fries. Or some of them would, you know, sit in the CEC and be having dinner when really they were playing along in person. But, you know, it looked, you know, we had to officially advertise that it was going to be an online-only event because of COVID. So some people did play along in person. Um, but a lot of people were online as well. Um, and before I did bingo, actually, Sub did bingo in Welcome Week, and that was hosted by Caitlin Rodriguez. And that one, people did not like that. They thought that the timing was off, and they didn't like that it was fully online. With that one, it, there was no you know, in-person playing along in the cafeteria illegally. Um, it was entirely online, so people would be you know, running to the CC to get prizes and stuff, and it wasn't the same experience. Um, so when Angel and I started with the um, bingo in person, um, that really kind of became the massive event that it is now, um, with huge turnout and big hype on calling out 069, you know. Uh, so, let's see, uh, over time it became more in person and less online, but it was a slow process of moving from the hybrid model to an in-person bingo experience, you know. But, yeah. Yes, indeed. Um, becoming an RA is something that I only did my junior year. And a lot of people, including Betty Albrecht, who's like the Dean of President's Life, think, you know, that I've been an RA for three years. I don't think, like, you know, she doesn't, like, advertise that or anything, but, like, we were doing a accepted student day tour, and she was talking to this person who was going to be an electrical engineer, and she said, oh, talk to John Bilkey, he's been an RA for three years and stuff, but no. I've been an RA for two years, two years. I was late to the party, um, but, you know, I, I, uh, I take the job very seriously, you know, and, and I, it makes it seem like I've been it for longer, you know. I, I do a good act of pretending to know what I'm doing. You know, so people, you know, they think, oh yeah, you know, he's been an RA for three years. Um, but with that, you know, I mean, like, why would I want to be an RA, right? I mean, there's all kinds of reasons that people say that they want to be an RA. Um, some people like the power, you know, they like to go around and bust people. And um, that's not why I did it. Some people just want the free housing. I would say like a lot of RAs are like that, where they say, you know, well, I'm not gonna really do anything. I'm just gonna hide in my room and I'm gonna take the free housing. Um, so that's a big motivator for it too. But, you know, the way I see it is kind of different from I would say almost all of my coworkers on this RA staff. So I see that in my position, my, my free housing salary is paid for by my residents, and I work for them. For a lot of people, it's a job where they work for the university. It's very top-down, you know. 
Like I work for, you know, Betty who works for John Walls, who works for blah, 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 and I take orders from the top and I, you know, push it down on my residents. Where, you know, I believe I work for my residents and uh, you know, I advocate for them if they have feedback, you know, that goes up. And so it's a very bottom up approach rather than top down. And that kind of goes into servant leadership. You know, they buzzword on campus, but that really is, if you boil it down, that is servant leadership, you know. It's, you know, you work for your customers, your clients, and you serve your community rather than I work for my boss. Um, and that's the approach that I see, you know. I think that as an RA, I have the unique position to develop my residents. So, you know, like Colin and Cordell um, started Mug, or they started Grub Club, not Mug Club, they started Grub Club this year as freshmen. So I helped to guide them through the process, kind of. I mean, they were pretty independent. I won't take credit for it, but you know, as far as like, who do I talk to? How do I get this process rolling? I tried to help them out with that. Um, I kind of helped Mug Club get started too um, with that. Um, and so, you know, just seeing how can I help people out and how can I develop other people around me? And I'll get further into that. You know, I have a whole nother part of this on that. But that's kind of the ascension, right? That, that's, that's what this is all building up to. So I do have the plaque here. This is the only thing that I'll show as an award that I received. This other thing is not related to awards. This, this is, you know, a piece of evidence, not, not a flex. But yeah, like, you know, holding the banner for MSOE at the St. Paddy's Day Parade and really, you know, bleeding. If you check my blood now, right, you prick my veins, it, it comes out red, black, and white with little MSOE logos on it now. I mean, that's, that's the point that we've reached, is ascending to this, I bleed MSOE red, oh, I'm fully invested now. That, that's kind of how this is all led up to. So going on to that, that's the end of my story, right? Now I'm going to go on to the wisdom that I've received. <clears throat> so a unique story that I like to tell, kind of the magnum opus of John Bilkey, is the story of how RHA rose from the ashes to be a beautiful, well-oiled machine, which is now presided over by Nash Beagle, who is in attendance here. Um, but last year, in May, we did not have a president for RHA. We did not have a board. We did not have members attending meetings. It was the board and it was me. And I was, you know, like, not even supposed to be there, like we were told by the hall directors that we could not come to RHA meetings. Um, and that kind of was one of the things that led to the downfall of the club. Also, they just wouldn't listen to feedback from residents, from RAs. Um, so it was kind of like attending these meetings wasn't meaningful anymore. Um, you know, Mitch is here. Mitch was the president for a lot of this. Um, it was a bad time for RHA. And for Mitch, it was very stressful, and it felt like he was just kind of pushing a rock up a hill, and it was rolling back on him. And there was, you know, it wasn't good. And for the members of the club, what they would do is they would just come to meetings, and they would, you know, say whatever, right? And then um, they would leave, and there was no uh, ownership in it, right? It's not like you were personally involved with any of that feedback being addressed. It's not like you were running these events. Like, you could be asked to volunteer for something that the board would come up with. But, um, you know, something that was introduced later, kind of going on to now, from what it used to be to what it is now. Um, here, I'll, I'll, I'll flesh that out. So, that's how it was. Over the summer, this is a screenshot from a PowerPoint that I made um, that I presented to the hall directors of Aiden Riley. That was our, our plan. But basically, we wrote up the pillars of RHA, we came up with this PowerPoint, and we said you know, to the hall directors that basically what we're doing with RHA doesn't really make sense. We're not developing residents. We're not giving them ownership in the club. Um, you know, You come to meetings, you leave, you don't really get anything out of it. Um, and so what can we do to help these people feel like they belong? What can we do to make them want to come back? How can we reward 
attendance at events. Um, and so by this point also, I convinced Aiden Riley to be the president also. That's another detail I forgot to mention. But, you know, RHA had a president now because, you know, Aiden Riley was appointed basically by me. So I came to Hall Director Noah Stevenson's office and I said, look, Noah, I found a president for RHA. And he said, oh, is it you? And I said, no, it's Aiden Riley. So that was good because, uh, you know, as an RA, you cannot be running RHA. That would be awful. Um, so yeah, I'm glad that we had that going. Aiden and I, we planned out this whole process of how RHA would be restructured over the summer and we presented it to the Hall Directors and they basically accepted it because um, you know, if they weren't going to work with us on redoing it, the club probably wouldn't exist anymore. I'm going to be honest. I mean, it, it was basically run to the ground. I mean, nobody was coming to meetings. And, you know, with a lot of clubs, if people stopped showing up, um, it would basically just die. But because this was run by the MSOE administration, they could just kind of, you know, try running it again the same way if they wanted to. There was no, you know, fear of it actually going away because as long as they were willing to, you know, give it a budget and have meetings and stuff, it, it would still exist. It's not like it was entirely student run and the students would just stop running it. It was also in part run by MSOE professional staff. And so in that way, it could not literally die, but you know, it, it wasn't being run well. So in that way, it was like, you know, it was not good. So we developed this plan. We decided that we wanted to have a new RHA that would develop people. Because the idea kind of with RHA is that we're, we're helping people become future RAs. That's the idea, anyway. Oh, Angela, are we uh, we're restarting the recording? Oh, yeah, we can do it now. But I, yeah. OK. Um, so but when I put this go. thing up, it's just whenever mm -hmm. like, you can give me like the next three minutes. Sure. Yeah. OK, I'll keep my eye out for that. So, RHA was in this pickle. Now, something to consider, right? Like before I go into in detail everything that we did with RHA, if you look at another club on campus, okay, so, right, so, okay, I'm, I'm gonna go there. They died this year, so, yeah, he's wearing the soft shirt too. We didn't coordinate this, right? But some does not exist anymore. And in part, it was also run by professional MSOE staff, so, Sub, when I came to MSOE, was the biggest club on campus. Yeah. You know, we ran fun events, you know. You would see clubs like, um, I, I don't know what an example would be, but maybe like IEEE, right? They run an oscilloscope workshop or, um, you know, other professional groups. That, that's a lot of that where you go to an event and you're going to learn something from it. You're, you're going to, like, get this skill for work, right? But Sub was entirely existing to run fun events. And this is before Campus Life existed. This was an entirely student-run group where they would put on things like the Fishbowl Toss or Battle of the Bands or a bunch of other things. Bob Ross and Bob Chill. Ross and Chill. Bob they Ross would do Chill, Bob yeah. Ross and Chill. So that was when they would play Bob Ross videos, give you paintbrushes and paint, and uh, you would eat chicken and waffles. We ran the dances too? They would also run dances, yeah. Oh my god. So it was a really fun club to be a part of because you could be a part of this larger group that had its own budget that would run fun things. And as time went on, part of it was COVID. I would say a lot of RHA's pains and really every club on campus's pains came from COVID because when you go from in-person meetings to video calls to back in person, it's very hard to get people to um, to go back into the way that things used to be, especially because, you know, if you think about college, you're only here for four years. And so the turnover is kind of an issue because a lot of the people who remember what it was before leave, you know, and then you have to figure things out again from the start. If you don't have that mentorship um, from the upperclassmen, that becomes a big problem. And so actually passing the torch effectively, like Campus Life would want us to do, is very important for every club. Um, so Sub suffered from that. You know, they had kind of lower turnout. But a big thing with that was also the dynamic of the paid Campus Life employees, where you would volunteer to go to Sub and you would possibly lead events, right, and you would do these things and then another person would be there getting paid to do the same thing. And that, you know, was a problem. Um, 
And you know, you could say with RHA that RAs were like getting paid to you know do stuff too, but it's not like we were paid hourly, right? We were paid to be RAs, and we didn't have to do anything with RHA. It was not at all required. So an unfair uh, comparison, I would say. Um, but where am I going with this? That is a question that I also ask. I just say, look, sub doesn't exist anymore. They did not successfully restructure. RHA successfully did. And now I'm going to lay out my secret sauce of how I, I accomplished this feat with Aiden Riley and with the RHA members that helped out throughout this year. Um, so one of the things I will point out, OK, big thing, big thing, right? This is an example of a certificate for perfect attendance at RHA meetings. I have mine because I own it, but we gave these to every RHA member who consistently attended meetings. And um, a big thing that I have is that we should be rewarding people for their hard work, and we should especially be rewarding volunteers because they are not getting paid to be there. Um, they are donating their time, and really, you know, they should have their contributions be recognized. And so I'm very big on recognizing contributions of people. So um, we gave out a bunch of these certificates. Um, and, you know, it, it could be considered a small gesture, right? But anything that you can do to show people that what they do matters and it's recognized is very important. Um, and so hopefully, like with this club, um, you know, I impart knowledge. And I give you hot tea and cookies and uh, you know granola bars. So the idea is that you also get a fair trade out of coming here. But I mean, you <laughs> it's important that you get a fair trade by you know going to meetings, by you know being a part of the clubs. You should be getting something out of it. And if you're not getting something out of it, maybe you consider you know why are you going to these meetings? That's something that I had to do with a few clubs. Um, which I won't list out. Um, I'm not saying sub though. Sub, I you know I continued to be with sub for a very long time. But there were other clubs I was in where I wasn't really getting much out of it, and um, you know my contributions were not recognized. Um, so going off of that, what else do we do? So we have the RHA event passport. Every RHA event you go to, you get a stamp in your passport. Um, and this is not an idea that I came up with. This is from the national parks. If you go to a national park gift shop, you'll find that they have a passport booklet where every national park that you go to, you get a little stamp in your booklet, and then it shows that you went to that park on that day. And I thought that was really cool. Um, I like stamps. I like stamping things. It's kind of fun. It's you know kind of quirky, right? So I figured RHA should do that too. And so this is almost like a rewards program where if you go to a RHA event, you get a stamp in your book, and after X amount of stamps, you get a t-shirt, you get a hat, you get a coffee mug, and that kind of stuff. And so not only are you going to attend more events because of the stamps in your book, but also um, you wear RHA merchandise, you have an RHA coffee mug, so we're actually just advertising the club more by rewarding our members. So this is like a great idea all around, I think. I mean, um, and you know, some people say, okay, well, this disproportionately is good for RHA members because they are going to attend every meeting. And uh, well, yeah, that's the point. I mean, I don't know what to tell you with that. Like, that's exactly the point. Um, and it, another thing with this, right, is not only do we have these events that we run, but something that I introduced as, you know, I stole this from Sub, because I think Sub, Sub might have like stopped doing this, is the event leads, right? So Sub so would say, oh, we want to do this. Which of you members are going to be the leads of this event? So we're going to say that you're in charge. You make the poster. You coordinate the volunteers. You do everything like this. And that was honestly one of my favorite parts of Sub, is that you know they gave you this ownership in, in the club. They gave you the ability to lead and to grow. And you, know, you think when you're electing your new board for the next year, um, you know, what do, what do I have as skills that I can use at this club? If you attended RHA, you know, you came to meetings, you said, oh, like my toilet doesn't flush or whatever. And then you didn't like gain skills from that, right? Like if you are leading events, if you're coordinating volunteers, if you're creating posters, those are skills that are used in executive board positions. So that is how SUB created a pathway to continuously have new presidents, to have new treasurers, right? To have a board every year. And the reason, partially, I would say that RHA did not have a board is that they were not doing that effectively. 
they weren't developing people to where they felt like they could do that. Yes, Angel. I'd say like the thing that really facilitated like so much of that success that Sub had was in their meetings. Like they'd have a you know a bunch of people all yeah. around mm -hmm. and. It, everyone would have like a chance to talk about um, like what future ideas they'd want to do for an event, yeah. that kind of thing. And I think that went hand in hand with having a lead for an event. Sure. Like if you wanted to do an event, you would lead it. Yeah, you could like, say you say like I want to do this, and then I will lead it because it was my idea. That that's a huge thing. And so I think with RHA, my hope is I I strongly believe that we were able to successfully do that. And if you led an event for RHA, you would get two stamps in your passport. So, boom, even more rewarding, right? Like, we're getting you that merch as quickly as we can if you're an active member of RHA. That's a big thing that we did. And we consistently fill our room. Our last meeting of the year was a party where, you know, RHA served food to the members. And, you know, it was entirely a fun thing. And that's, again, giving back to the members and thanking them for coming to meetings consistently and for helping out the club. Because really, um, We've had, I think, our most successful year that I can remember for RHA this year. And that is something that I am extremely proud to have been a part of. Um, and if that is my legacy at MSOE, that is something I am very, very satisfied with. Um, so I think we're in a great spot with that. Another thing that I say is what you know is way more important, or what you know versus who you know. Who you know is significantly more important because you don't need to know everything you just need to know somebody who knows what you're talking about. And so if we think about the MSOE Historical Society, I don't know all the history of MSOE, but I know, you know, Nick Seidler, I know Dr. Tritt, I know Dr. Strangeway, I know a bunch of professors who, and you know, faculty and alumni and stuff, and I know people who are around campus who I can go to and I can ask about these things or who I can pull into meetings. Um, and that network is, I think, what has been the, the secret sauce of getting this thing running and having it be successful. Um, because, you know, you don't want me to be up here talking about MSOE history all day. You want to hear it from the people who live through it. And so by, I think a, a big part of how I grew this network is really by being an RA. Like, as, as a RA, I have to talk with Nick Seidler, who is in the Residence Life Department, but also I worked with marketing. I worked with, um, uh, what are they, uh, admissions, I worked with them. Um, I didn't really work with alumni relations, and unfortunately I never really worked with the library until this year, and those were kind of the things that were fleshed out over the year, but I still had a pretty decent network of people, you know, Mitch in the EECS office, Raiden Pluchinski, whose parents went to MSOE, right? I mean, you, I can go out here and I can list out, oh, I know these people who know these people who have gone through these things, and that is the secret sauce of how this has been successful. But also, um, you know, like when you're working in, in industry, you're not expected to know everything, but you can go to someone else in the office, right, and you can ask them questions. And just being able to acknowledge that you don't know something, but you can go to somebody to help you out is, is very important, and that's an important skill. So, um, you know, I, I just think that, you know, it's very important, especially when you consider, you know, that you're in college now, you're meeting all these people in your classes, um, they're all going to be professional engineers, and it's very important that you network with them um, because that could be some, some network that you could pull on later to either, you know, get advice to maybe find a job, you know, those kinds of things. Those are all very important. Um, you know, I mean, attending lectures and going to class, you can watch YouTube videos and learn, you know, all of these things. It's, it's on the internet, but what you go to college for is not just to learn you know, about Laplace transforms or a Fourier series, right? You go to college to meet people, to, to gain skills, and to become your best self. Um, and so that's what it's all about. It's not just learning, it's, you know, becoming ascending, okay? It's becoming <laughs> the next level. Um, so that's kind of why I also put a big focus on that. And that's something that I kind of learned from my dad, you know, who likes to network and do sales, right? Another thing is thinking about the big picture. So I have two examples here that I have pictures of. One is um, I have a story on the career fair and I have another story on super mileage. Um, 
So at the career fair, you know, as an RA, I go around my floor and I tell people, hey, you know, make sure you go to the career fair. It's, it's very important. And they think, okay, well, you know, I'm a freshman. It's, it's not important. Or, you know, if they're a sophomore, um, maybe they're just busy, right? A lot of people tell me, you know, they can't go to the career fair because they have an exam coming up, because they have homework to do. And I tell them, you know, I tell them, look, I mean, I don't think you go to MSOE to do homework or to take exams, right? You go to MSOE because you want a job. And so, should your priority be, you know, I want to get an A instead of a B on my exam, or should it be, I want to get an internship for the summer and make money? And so, if you put it into a context like that, then it really changes things for them. And, and that's something that also needs to connect with a lot of people, is think about the bigger picture, right? Think about why are you here, what are your goals, not the short term, oh, I'm busy, you know, oh, I got this thing to do and that, right? But like. You're working towards something bigger than just what you're doing now. And to keep that in mind is, is something that's very important. And Amy. July 29th, my bad. 29th, yeah, <laughs> yes, that's about correct. Yeah, and I can it is, I have until May 16th to get like a list of names and what we're, and what the presentation is going to be about. So you have, Six days, if anybody's interested. Yeah. yeah. If you're in the Microsoft team, I'm sure you can reach out to me. Uh, yeah. Um, and I'll post something there, too. Yeah. But just a heads up. Is there anybody here who's not in the teams? Okay, I'll add you. I'll add you at the end of the day. Indeed. Okay. All right, so I guess with that, I'll continue on. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Other story. So now this is going to be the speed run around, because I do see it as 550 already. <laughs> but we... The super mileage competition had its last SAE super mileage competition last summer, and I was very lucky to be there because I've been involved with this club, kind of, since freshman year. Like, I was a social media man for two years. Um, my actual hands-on involvement with the car was kind of limited because, you know, uh, it was tough to fit into the schedule. But, you know, I did get to go out there, see the car run. Um, we got some, like, 200 miles per gallon, and it was really cool to see. But when we went out there, um, a lot of effort is put into tuning the engine on the car, right? I mean, the, the competition is we go out to Michigan, we build this car over the course of the year, and we want it to have the best fuel efficiency that we can. That's the competition, and that's how we rank against other schools. So when we went out to Michigan, we had this car, and you know we would go on the computer a bit and we would tune up the software for the engine so that we would get the ideal mixture of gas and air and so that's called tuning the engine um, we spent a little bit of time doing that but you know we were able to get it on the track pretty you know early on compared to other schools which was really nice we didn't have huge uh, problems with the engine running or like basic functions of the car that other schools were having um, so that was impressive, I thought. Um, and what we would do is we would put it on the track and they, we would get you know, a provided gas tank and it would run around the track and they would measure how much gas we burned in you know, our run around the track. And um, we ran around once and the hood of the car flew off and so we had to stop the engine, we had to put the hood back on, we started the engine again and then we went going. And every time you start an engine that takes a lot of fuel. So we knew that our fuel economy would not be as good as it could be because we had that problem with the hood flying off the car. So we did our run, we did okay. We actually didn't get in last by a long shot despite that problem. So um, you know, we thought, okay, we'll do another run. We're gonna tune the engine again. That's the engineers on the team deciding we're gonna tune the engine again. Why? I don't know, because we can do better because uh, we're doing another run anyways. Um, and they spent a few hours tuning this engine again when we'd already done that. We knew that we ran the car around the track, it, the engine ran fine, and you know we just had the, the hood come off. And it was our driver's first time going around the track. Um, so all of these things together would make it not ideal, but you know if you think about it with the big picture, you don't have to tune the engine again, you just have to put the driver back on the track and just do it again immediately <laughs> after. And even if you know it's not as great as it could be with a perfect engine tune, um, we could have just gone around the track as many times as we wanted and gotten better scores. But we spent hours 
just tuning the engine to get the perfect ratio of gas and air. And by the time we were done and we, you know, we were like, oh, we're almost out of time, let's put it on the track again, the engine was stalling because it wasn't getting enough fuel. Um, the tune was bad. So our second run was not actually, you know, we, we had to keep starting the engine over and over to just get the car to move around the track. Um, so our performance was significantly worse the second time around. If we just went back out on the track, um, that would have been good enough. Because if you think about in the competition, the like 90% of the time the car goes around the track, it's coasting. The engine is not running. Um, because you wouldn't run the engine the whole time, that would use more fuel. So you drive it up a hill and then you kill the engine and you go around it. As much of the fuel economy comes from the driver starting and stopping the engine as it does from the engine running itself. And that's something that our engineers could not um, truly comprehend. You know, they spent a lot of time trying to get the engine to be perfect, but they didn't connect that, okay, well, if the driver just, you know, goes around again because, well, she's drove around the track once already, she knows the terrain, um, she can start stop the engine, we know that the engine runs fine. Um, that wasn't really good enough, and that was a big problem. And so getting out of this engineer mindset of, you know, I need this machine to be perfect, it's not always just about the machine, it's about everything else around it. It's about the driver, it's about, you know, the hood flew off, it was a bad run. Um, and if we just kept running it over and over and getting, you know, slightly better scores, that would have been our competitive edge rather than, you know, waiting around trying to tune it perfectly. So that's another thing. Um, another point that I have is treating people as ends. So this is an idea that comes from Immanuel Kant. Okay, this is a, a topic that is covered in my ethics course, so it's not like I'm some like wise philo philosophy guy. It's, it's literally standard MSOE ethics course. This is something that they cover. But really, I think this is something important for people to consider, not even you know, at the end of their senior year, but throughout their whole time at MSOE and throughout their lives. Um, what does this mean, treat people as ends? Well, you know, there's a common saying, the ends justify the means. And so, you know, if you use a person as a means, that means that you're just using them, you know, you say, I need something from you, and then they do it, and then, you know, it's whatever. Um, but when you treat people as ends, they are also part of that final thing. And that goes into my idea of, like, the fair trade and making sure that people are, you know, getting something out of it. But um, you know, you need to make sure that when you're interacting with people that, you know, it's a mutual thing um, and that they're being treated like people and not as mean. So like I was walking through the cafeteria, I said, hi, Kristen, to Kristen Landall, and she stopped and looked at me and she's like, oh, I thought you were going to ask me to do something. I was like, no, I was just saying hi to you, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, oh my God, she has been through a lot, you know. <laughs> But um, that, that's kind of the heart of it, right? Is you, you gotta make sure that people are really feeling like they're cared about when you have them working with you. Um, and that, you know, they're developing. You're developing people. That's something that I keep, you know, mentioning again, but the two big things for me are development and servant leadership. And those, those should be, if you get anything out of this presentation today, it's, you know, you wanna develop people as a leader and you want to be a servant leader. Um, and that, that's like golden. That's all you need to know. Um, I, I think this is my final point here. Aspire for greatness and really care. Um, so another thing with my, my mindset, right? I mean, I go into this and um, I think if something's worth doing, it's worth doing it right, you know? The most permanent um, solution is like a half-baked jerry rig thing, right? Because if it's good enough, it just stays in this kind of okay state. You, you got to make sure that when you do something, it's like a long-term, well-thought-out, beautiful thing. And so, for example, if you're working at a company, um, I'm sure eventually you'll find you know, that you're working on a product where it was designed in this half-baked manner, and they're just kind of band-aiding things along and it's awful to work with. There's a code base that's like 20 years old and a bunch of bugs that are impossible to find. Um, you know, Cordis comes to mind, right, of something that's like this. Um, and you know, you wanna make sure that you're not doing this half-baked work. You want everything to be well-documented. You want, you know, this thing to be great. 
if you think about like MSOE, um, when we were first planning our dorms, we thought that we'd have this massive technology park and we would have you know a skywalk, and um, they were aspiring for greatness. And then you go you go to like you know 2010s, the buildings are falling apart; they're in shambles. I mean. Even now, you look at the CC, and they just renovated it, they aspired for greatness, and they didn't follow through with it because if you look around the game room, the floor is completely dirty, you know, everything is kind of already falling apart. And so, you know, yeah, you can make something new that's great, but then I guess part of it is not even then aspiring for greatness, but also following through with it and making sure that in every step of the way, um, you get something good and you take care of it, and uh, that is something very important. Like um, another part of the RHA plan, I forgot to mention, is that RHA got a room. Um, when I was a freshman, RHA had a room. They lost their room in COVID. It became an office, um, and then we finally got a room back. That was part of it because that was another thing that our members could have ownership in. Um, and so I, I think it's very important that we take care of this room that we vacuum it when it gets dirty, you know, because we didn't have a room, now we do, and we need to show that we can take care of it, and we need to take pride in our room. Um, and uh, so yeah, that's, that's another thing, right? Aspiring for greatness and making sure that you don't um, settle with good enough. And uh, really caring, you know, really caring is another thing. That's something that I think is inherent in people, and maybe it's something that can be learned but um, there are certainly people that you will encounter where you learn that they really care and that stands out from other people. Um, and those people are, are really natural born leaders, right? But like if I think around MSOE, I think Betty, Betty Albrecht is somebody who really cares. You know, when we were um, in kind of that hybrid COVID era, we didn't have enough custodial staff. So Betty, who was the assistant dean of residence life who was the boss's boss or the boss or whatever of this residence life department was going around our cafeteria cleaning the tables because there was food on them and they were gross and um, you know even today if she walks up to MLH and there's a can on the ground she picks it up and throws it out and so I think Betty is someone that I really look up to as somebody who really cares and takes pride in her work and I think that the students that interact with her uh, really find that that is you know a big part of who she is and that is something that radiates out of her. And the people that work with her also, you know, are positively impacted by her personality and how she really cares. Um, so I think that being a person who really cares, that aspires for greatness, that, you know, treats others well, uh, who treats them as a, a complete person who should get a fair trade out of an exchange, that's something important. You know, it's important to network with people, to meet people, um, to develop those social relationships. Um, and it's important to do things with a goal in mind. Uh, and that, that overall is what you should take away from this presentation, which maybe isn't something new, maybe not earth shattering, but it is something that through my experience, I have definitely learned and taken away from. So that is all. Are there any questions? <laughs> yes, Mitch. Do you have any regrets, Sean? Do I have any regrets? I'm sure that there are minor things that I could say, you know, could have been done better, but overall, I think that my path to where I am now um, is pretty good. Um, any mistakes I've made, you know, I learned from those, and I can't think of any major regret that I would have you know, in my time. Yes, Brooke. I think I'm a, uh, I was a little bit confused for the, for the, trying to remember the name for the club, the super mileage? Yes when you were discussing how they were constantly trying to tweak the engine to get yes. a, like a better ratio, were they at least able to fix the hood flying off the car problem? So we did that with duct tape. Okay. That was a separate thing. And then after that, I mean, we could have stopped there, but we kept going with, oh, well, you know, while the car's out here in our maintenance bay anyways, let's keep tuning the engine. Okay. And then they did that basically all day. Um, so, yeah, it's the downfall of the engineer, you know. Good enough is, I guess that counteracts one of the points I made, where good enough is not good enough. But, you know, it's also keeping in mind your goals and, you know, the bigger picture. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Hey, on um, that last slide, that building, well, yes. was it supposed to be a dorm? 
Yeah, so this is now Peaks Tower, used to be Roy W. Johnson Residence Hall. Um, this was the concept art when it first came out. Um, Skywalk. Yeah, it looked kind of similar. The Skywalk would go across to the athletic field, that's now the softball field. Um, and uh, yeah, that's kind of the vision that they had for it. And it was cut down, you know, to basically just a rectangular building, uh, half as wide as that is. But um, yeah, that's what they had in mind in the beginning. Yeah. Anything else here? Yes, Angel. What did you think about your electrical engineering education here at Missouri? Do you think I that was? Do you think that was more or less impactful than everything else? Well, I think, you know, it definitely set me up for my career, right? Like, I would go to work and I would be able to talk with people and I could, you know, understand what they were saying. Um, when you graduate from a four-year engineering degree program, you're not expected to know everything. Like, you get the basic fundamentals of, you know, how do I get to a point where I can work for a company and hopefully not be a net negative, but be a bit of a net positive? But like especially you learn with the internships, um, you don't know everything, and there's no way that MSOE could teach you everything because there's so many different paths that careers take you and different fields that you would specialize in that they could never cover everything. And so a big part is really just you know reaching out to your coworkers and knowing people who will know answers to your questions. And you know that's something that also I gained through MSOE it was not only did I, you know, learn these things, but I also collaborated with people, and I, you know, if I was stuck on a problem in homework, I could ask someone a question and, and you know, get through it. Um, so that's something that, you know, MSOE had forced me to do that was very helpful in industry. Okay. Yeah. But, I mean, overall, it's a fantastic program, you know. I mean, I was definitely as qualified as my coworkers in that internship program that I was in. I'm a bit flabbergasted by your LinkedIn statistics. Yes. How are you able to foster a thousand plus connections and uh, different people across different like fields like that? Yeah, so what I do is when I go to an event at work, when I go to an event at school, when I meet someone at the career fair, I add them on LinkedIn. So if I shake someone's hand at the career fair after I talk to them, I say, do you have a business card? I take it. Add them on LinkedIn, you know, and so that's how you get to these thousands of people, you know, and you go through the suggested connections and oh, they go to MSOE, boom, I'll connect with them, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, when I interview with a company, that person I talk to, I connect with them on LinkedIn. And not only does that mean that those people will see, you know, what's going on with me, if I'm looking for a job, you know, I can help them out if they're looking for a job, but also, when I apply for a job and the recruiter looks at me on LinkedIn, they see that I'm connected with somebody that they know because I have all of these connections. And then, you know, that gives me an advantage above other people. Okay. Yes, JP. Do you plan on being involved in MSUE as an alumni? Uh, yeah, I think so. You know, I floated the idea of, you know, if RHA wants me to continue being the bingo man, I could do that. I imagine with this club, you know, if they ever want me to come in or just attending meetings, I, I would be happy to do that. Um, so I'll be staying in the area. You do you have you know. a job lined up? I do. I do have a job lined up. Um, and I used a lot of the experience I talked about here in that interview. They were very impressed with that. So yeah, I'm very excited to have a job <coughs> lined up for graduation. Yes, Angel. Suppose you were the CEO of Bilkey Incorporated okay. in 20 years, you know, very successful company. Yeah. Is a uh, Bilkey residence hall going to be a thing? Uh, it's a possibility, you know. Um, I don't know. Mia works for the alumni relations guys that squeeze money from people, so I won't be <laughs> too positive on the outlook. But, you know, I think MSOE is a great place. It's treated me well. It's given me many opportunities. And, you know, giving back is something I can see myself doing. I look Definitely. forward to calling you my phone call. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, Mitch. Will there be a world where there exists assistant adjunct professor John Bilby? That is also a possibility, I think. I mean, I, I really like this, you know, lecturing, um, you know, teaching. I think, you know, it's something that runs through my family. It's something I definitely could see myself doing. Um, 
something I enjoy. So, yeah. I mean, even with work, um, oh, you know, I'll say this on camera because it's, it's pretty funny, but, you know, I was interviewing with my company, I met my future coworkers. I believe there's two or three of them now that would be on my team of engineers, and they're both Russian, like, 70-year-olds, right? So I've identified that, okay, I will probably be in charge in, like, five to seven years, right? So that, <laughs> that is some, I found this opportunity, and I, I told this to the people I interviewed with. I'm like, look, I, I don't think I'm the best engineer out there. Um, but I, I'm pretty good with people. I'm pretty good with you know seeing the big picture, and that's kind of where management comes in, right? Is I'm good with managing teams and developing people, and um, that's kind of where I see myself. You know, if they ask like, you know, where do you see yourself in five years? I know a lot of people in my company that were you know writing code that were designing boards for 40 years, and I don't really see myself doing that. You know, I see myself moving up the ladder and uh, helping people out with development, you know, getting good projects in, and overseeing all the moving parts of larger projects. You know, that's something that really gets me excited. Um, so, yeah. John? Yes. My, da my dad went here. He went here for software engineering and he came back to get his master's in uh -huh. engineering management or something. I don't know if that's still a thing here, but yeah, you should look into it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, my company also pays for uh, master's degrees. So. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yep. All right. Well, I think that'll do it here. Thank you all for coming. I hope that this is worth your time. Kind of the lecture by myself, but I really hope that you got something out of this. Yeah.